I'm a pet, pet waste sanitation, sanitation engineer. engineer. All right, so we're going to talk about shit now, like excrement, maybe for the whole rest of the show. Um, and if you guys really get uncomfortable and you start to kind of pull away and squirm, I'll throw in an equestrian gynecologist joke just oh to put God. you at ease, okay? Yeah. Different vibe down there. Pet shop boys become the pet shop cowboys. Oh, no. Boy Harsher becomes Cowboy Harsher. <laughs> and worst of all, Boy George becomes Cowboy George. I don't think he's happy. He's not happy about that at all. This is the Snaggletooth Extreme Metal Podcast. <laughs> Well, we survived Hell in the Harbor. What a great time. Yeah, it was so really many good. great bands. Um, I want to say, of course, Goat Horror was good. Of course, School of Grind was good. Yeah. Um, you know, they didn't fall flat of any expectations. Um, and Pig Destroyer was good. But I want to say, you know, Deceased blew me away. Yeah. Um, also, as of note, Vomit Forth. I think Vomit Forth was my pick of the best band. Yeah. Mainly because. Who were they up against? There was somebody big. Oh, it was Napalm Death. Was Napalm outside. Death. So they were again, They were inside while Napalm was playing outside. And that singer was just, he was doing the D. Snyder thing. He was like, I want more. Get the pit going. You know? He made him run back and forth. Yeah, he did. He, he, he divided the room. Yeah, he was in full command. And they're a kick-ass band. Yeah. Man. Yeah, they yeah. were on. He Bottom really put on a hell of a show. And There's always one that we kind of are like, like a sleeper that'd be fine you know and yeah. sadistic ritual was great absolutely great it was like it was like metallica in 1990 which was incredible yeah really really good and inner armor also just slayed the night inter armor was like an out of body <laughs> experience i mean just and i got to tell tj uh the drummer tj afterwards i got to tell him what a fanboy i am and gush a little bit um it was great um we had a great time we made a lot of new friends yeah, I saw some old friends. Yeah, um, everybody is always so great at those places, including yeah. the lady who accidentally kicked a bottle into you and then told you it wasn't your fault. I remember that. Yeah. Oh, and uh, <laughs> the thing now, and I know most of you probably already know this, is you don't just crowd surf, but you crowd surf um, with some sort of headgear on. It, some of them are like full mascot gear. Almost. Yeah, yeah. The one guy that we really liked, he had a horse head, and we'd be like, "Oh, look, horse man's up," you know. And we actually tried to find him. I wanted to interview horse man with this thing on, but. I couldn't identify him and then you know probably that, it was pretty hot so i yeah, yeah. sure he d horse headed yeah. immediately d horse headed yeah and uh we said hi to sammy for the other one yeah special shout out to teresa who helped us so much with trying to get an interview with sadistic ritual set up thank you so much teresa which we did do however we had some sound issues the sound issues just it didn't come so, through so, but like i said we fixed it we fixed it it's all better now well, how about a rain check? <laughs> Let's just stick to dinner. Okay. So I guess more. Oh, one more thing about Helm the Harbor. The bands that we uh, talk to week to week, the visual element is, oh, you, they always emphasize, oh, if you're a new band, you're getting started. The visual element is so important. The makeup, the videos, the backdrops. All. Cannibal Corpse's backdrop, they didn't even bother to shrink it down to size, it just says C A N N I B, and that's it. And it's like, oh, if you don't know who we are, then what the fuck are you doing here? You know, it was just, uh, I couldn't stop thinking about that. I was like, wow, that's good enough. You know, Hannah, okay. Yeah. Oh, and the what elusive. They displayed too, I'll tell you what. We didn't Ooh. stay for the elusive holder because she was really late and we were really tired. Yeah. But yeah. she's apparently. She was, she closed out the show. Yeah. We we've actually tried to interview her a couple of times, but she only does email interviews. Yeah, and she we asked we, her at the show. We wish she, her nothing but luck. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But hmm. I understand some people are not going to be crazy to get in front of that, a camera. That black metal anonymity. Yes. So okay. So uh, moving on, I had to get some uh, work done to my car the other day, mm -hmm. and we only have one car, so I had to sit in the lobby of Firestone and wait and drink really bad coffee. And I got subjected to something that mainstream America seems to like. It was Good Morning America or one of those shows. And it was like freaking painful. So Stace and I, I decided we can top it. So let's call this segment Start Your Day with Decay featuring Mark and Stace. <laughs> Stay 
birthdays coming up. We've got some real important stories. Jacqueline Del Barrio. Who is she, you ask? The owner of Fuzzy Notions. This is a woman-owned company that makes the most adorable slippers, and they're all 100% made from kiwi fruit fur. Oh my God, I must have these immediately in my collection. We're all itching to hear all about it. Oh, I'm getting a little itchy thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, who else we got, Stace? Coming up, we have actress Jordan Glover has just finished taping her final appearance on Chicago Fire. We'll be revisiting our favorite Jordan moments from Chicago Justice, Chicago Fire, Chicago PD, Chicago Urology, Chicago Taxidermy, and Chicago Sanitation. Uh, also, I think she made an appearance on Chicago NYPD Blues, which makes very little sense. But Oh my gosh, Stace, what will I watch on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday? <laughs> I mean, this is devastating. There's going to be a void in my life from 9 to 10 every night now. I don't know how we'll cope. Guess who we got on the show today? Who? Your favorite rapper, Ishi Ja Sweetie <laughs> Poon. Yes. Wow. She has just announced her third pregnancy at the age of 47. We'll be checking in with this brave young woman's new bundle of joy and her bedazzled Glock with matching diaper bag for the show. She is so brave, just for all women out there and armed in the most fashionable way. Yeah. What could be right. more American? And then we've got one more for you. Up next, we have the brave story of a woman who overcame her fear of books and paper cuts and dyslexia. Wow. And become a librarian. She Only is, in America. It, it's just such an amazing story of overcoming adversity. She is now fluent in the Dewey Decimal System. So moving and motivational. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We're going to go to our sponsor now, but this has been Start Your Day with Decay with Mark and Stace. Okay, shall we talk about our feature interview this week? Why don't you take it away, dear? Our feature interview this week is with none other than Pat Radieri and Brian Wilson from the classic Fort Lauderdale death thrash pioneers, Hell Witch. This is their first new album in 13 years, Annihilational Intercension. Say that for Always times, needing yes. a thesaurus, yes. <laughs> that actually drops this week, yeah. and we have a lengthy chat covering the history of the band and how young Brian essentially moved from being a Hell Witch obsessed fan to now being their full-time drummer. Amazing. All of this is delivered during a violent thunderstorm. Yeah. So you'll notice a bit of flickering lights, uh, but I think Pat wins the award for the most horns ever thrown on the show. Every time the lights came back up, you'll see him throw horns. Yeah. We, we all started doing it. And at one point they were only lit spookily and eerily enough by the lights of their cell phone. So stay tuned for that. It's so moving. <laughs> he doesn't even have a bedazzled block. Okay, so let's get going from the killer 1990 album, Siskiel Miscreancy. This is Hellwitch with Nosferatu. Okay, let's talk about Patreon. The site is patreon.com slash snaggletoothpodcasts. I teased it on the other show. Um, I'm going to tell a story um, and make it, add it to the exclusive content archives of Patreon. Back when uh, I was a teenager, early 20s, we lived at a vinyl emporium called... Vinyl Discovery. Yes, and that was the... Really name. Yes. That's where I got, you know, the first Pestilence record. That's where I got um, all three of the first Slayer albums. That's I, where I got I, everything. Honestly, you You bought it. Angel Dust there. I did. You bought Angel Dust into Dark Pass, and then you sadly we lost it, it. a pilgrimage. Pilgrimage to vinyl, we would call it. Yep. So anyway, it got to be such a big deal. We started to actually recruit others to come with us because then we could get more records out of the deal. And there was one hanger on that we uh, attempted to exploit. And you're just going to have to hear what happened. In a very curious way it ended up. So this is just one of many bonus features that's on Patreon. We need your support. We need, we need uh, more minions so that we can keep the show going and making it better. The subscription is only $6.66 a month in order for us to unlock all this for you. And we've also started doing our out and abouts. Well, we call them snaggle trips. We do. We call them snaggle trips. Um, so we are broadcasting from places around town. Yeah. Things to get out to do. 
uh, just to get out, have a little bit of fun. Podcast where no one has podcasted before. So we did have to get some additional equipment for that. So we really, really could help. appreciate your help. We know you guys love us. And you guys... Making the show better and better and better. Yeah. yeah. I'm also going to be back in the kitchen. Actually, I'll do it tomorrow. We keep forgetting to do that. I'll do yeah. it tomorrow. I'm just going to make like tomorrow, once we get everything updated, let's just do like Patreon, Patreon. Yeah. Because I got to, I'm backed up too. So anyway, so let's move on. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about shit now, like excrement. Maybe for the whole rest of the show. Um, and if you guys really get uncomfortable and you start to kind of pull away and squirm, I'll throw in an equestrian gynecologist joke just to put God. you at ease. Okay. So here we go. Have you ever walked into a spot of pot and you think, this place is a shithole? <laughs> remember, uh, remember that place, Fish and Barrel? Oh. Way up in the boonies of Maryland. That, speaking of holes, there. It's so easy to fish there. They they pride themselves on this. You could pra- the the fish are practically like jumping into the boat for you. You could just like hold out I the cooler. They'll jump right into it. I was concerned because if you caught a fish, you had to pay for it by yeah. the pound, and the fish were really big and really looking to be caught. So I was worried with my boys. I'm like, don't go in that expensive pond. We're going over here where the crappies are. Yeah, yeah. We're um, good. And then, but. Spot of pot related. So, you know, they did have an outdoor type bathroom and you went up these stairs and it was a typical looking spot of pot, except you realize after you're mid P, it's just coming out the bottom of this platform and falling directly onto the ground. Basically, it's a blind to pee in. There's a hole in the ground. You're, yeah. You're, you're, you're shitting in a hole, basically. Yeah. Well, yeah. luckily I was only peeing. I would have been mortified if it had been That's anything else. That's some country up there. I'll tell you. Um, yeah. Hey, you ever see those, uh, those septic tank trucks with the big, with the big hose and the, the, you know, they have a very defined schedule, um, of different stops where they go to drain, drain out the septic tanks. Um, you know what that, uh, schedule is called? No. It's a shit list. (laughs) Well, I guess you could say the same for those dog poop scooping companies that we keep saying. I guess if you're too busy to... Clean up your own dog shit. So you're at a gala event. How do you how do you dress up at that? You, you know, it, it's really says, hard. You if, like you know, you're at a convention and jobs thing. it's like, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I find and shovel other people's dog shit. I'm a pet, pet waste sanitation, sanitation engineer, engineer. I think is the technical. I like that. I like that. Um, and while we're on the subject of poop and poop adjacent. Can you imagine what the impact on chicken farmers would be once Chick-fil-A decides to eventually open up on Sunday? I mean, it's going to be huge. They're going to have to increase the steroids, make the cages smaller, get them all fattened up. And that's just the employees. <laughs> the birds are a whole nother story. Sorry, they let those employees run around. They let them run around. Yeah. Um, so I've told, I've, I think I've talked about this guy before. We had this Glenn Bernie redneck that was our sales manager. Uh, years ago when I worked at a different company and he would say the best stuff he would he he would get things wrong like he would say he kind of did the George W. Bush where he would almost get the phrase right where, where Dan Quayle would do the, almost oh, yeah. get the phrase right um, almost sir and he would latch on to a phrase for like a day and he would just do it over and over again um, we had this meeting and all the muckety mucks were there and he kept talking about how customer demand had increased excrementally Oh my God. Nobody had the stones to correct them. And then oh. we were all trying to keep it together. And then later my guy started. You were trying to keep your shit together? We're trying to keep our shit together, right? And la- later, like one of the guys that worked for me is like, Mark, this m- this meeting was excrementally better. I'm like, stop it. Stop it. We're not going to do that. <laughs> excrementally better. Yeah. Oh. Um, so in animal news, I was looking around at, um, remember Junkyard Dogs? Mm-hmm. The concept of yeah. Um, it turns out that junkyard dogs are becoming a thing of the past. Yeah. Because in this age of lawyers, if you trespass on a junkyard or like a salvage place or uh, metals, you know, where you cash in the metal or whatever. Yeah. Um, if you get attacked by that dog, you could sue the junkyard. And that's what's happening. Like the, I was trying to break in. Your dog bit me. I sue you. And I win. Can't it's you get crazy. out of that with the beware of dog sign? I always thought that's why people had those. No, it's a, it's like... a problem. I mean, um, 
So it's kind of your get out of jail free card. If you have a, you know, beware of cat sign and they scratch you, aren't you just not liable anymore? It doesn't do jack shit for anybody, you know. So I'm just thinking that the conversion of junkyard pit bulls and rottweilers to becoming truffle sniffing dogs, that's going to be difficult. <laughs> Maybe they could be drug sniffing dogs, bullet belt sniffing dogs, something. Truffle sniffers, yeah. So right, here's a question, again, keeping with animals and excrement related. If you have a bunch of snakes, lizards, and big cats and alligator, whatever, at what point do you become an actual zoo? Like how many animals does it take? What's the number? Because one wildcat, it seems, could be the difference between the Southampton Zoo and Zeke's wildlife shanty. I've been Where do you draw the line? Zoos. Where's that Plimpton Zoo is borderline? Plum Plumpton, Plumpton Park Zoo. Plumpton Park Zoo. That's Zoo. up in Cecil Tucky, yeah. yeah. You know who That's kind that of in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. Very weird. And they had that. Um, they have that zoo in Salisbury. Yeah. It's kind of small, but they had, at least they had years ago, a black panther that just he sat up in his tree and looked at you like you were a Scooby snack. Yeah. But he was like their biggest animal. Yeah. When I went to Plumpton Park, that leans more on the Zeke's wildlife yeah. side for me. Definitely. So you're in the middle of the woods. The spotted pots don't have floors. <laughs> What a shithole. Anyway. So. so, yeah, but I was starting to think, I mean, we have four cats and a dog, so I think I'm going to start charging admission to the people who come in our house. I, I mean, just to help cover the chewy cost. I yeah. mean, we could put up, you know, a snaggle farm sign. Yeah. yeah. Isn't the circus really just a mobile zoo where they taught the animals tricks? Kind of, they yeah. They poop a little bit more consistently. I don't, I don't you know. And, and clowns. Okay. I can feel it. Texas. Texas is big time horse country, right? Mm. So, question. Do the gynecologists in Texas have leather stirrups? <laughs> the trail glider anatomic model. Do you think the Texas females, they go in, you see them pull out the stirrups and they're like, that's not, those aren't stirrups. Where's the trail gliders? You know. Um, hey, I warned you guys. I warned you guys. Um, also, boys are cowboys in Texas. It's cowboy country. Does this mean that altar boys are altar cowboys at church? Possibly. Uh, maybe Eucharistic Rangers, we call them. I like Eucharistic Rangers. Kind of like the Texas Rangers. It's a different yeah. vibe down there. Pet shop boys become the pet shop cowboys. Oh, no. Boy Harsher becomes cowboy Harsher. <laughs> and worst of all, Boy George becomes cowboy George. I don't think he's happy. He's not happy about that at all. Do you really want to hurt him? Hey, did you hear a rumor? Uh, speaking of Texas, did you hear a rumor that there was a there was a huge ranch in San Antonio that we're going to have to relocate? They had like something like 300, 400 steer, and they were going to have to relocate them to another another location, mm -hmm. right? But the plan ended up being scrapped. You know why? Why? Because the cattle herd. Oh God! You think people that are in agriculture, farmers, farmer adjacent, are offended by phrases like "funny farm"? And when you die, you bought the farm. You think they're offended by that? Okay. I'll bet the ranch, some of them have complained. If you can say it, someone will be offended. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. Well, we can always farm out our jokes to a third party. I see what you did there. Okay. All right. On that note, let's play another Hell Witch song from the new album, Annihilational Intersention. This is Solipsistic Immortality. <laughs> Okay, um, our ad this week is our home chef. Um, I have tried other meal delivery services. Um, home chef has the fresh, freshest ingredients. They will change the way you cook. I used to be a very much, I would make the meat and then make maybe some packaged noodles or rice and some- Make the meat, Adrian. Frozen um, vegetables, frozen pre-cut French yeah. fries, no more. Uh, ever we put sawdust, sawdust in the hamburgers while we're at it. Sorry, sorry. Ever since Home Chef, they've changed the way I cook. Everything comes fresh. Your produce is fresh. They teach you how to easy it is to slice up a potato and make very tasty fries in your oven, which is healthier than the fried version. Mm. Um, they have great meals. They have great meal selections. I will tell you, we have coming up a spicy chicken parmesan with zucchini. I'll probably vegetate it. Um, Anko spice chicken and pesto regatta and vegetable flatbread, but they always let you do changes. So I added some steak strips to that one. 
Um, if you don't like meat, that's fine. The next week's menu features a Haystack Impossible burger. So you can use meat alternatives. Yeah. Don't like that? That's fine. You can sub in ground beef, ground pork, whatever you want. They have such a great drop-down menu. You can add in desserts. You can add in smoothies. They have so many options you can go with the bags where you cook yours own they also have options if maybe you know you're going to be in a hurry one day that week literally it comes in its own pan and you pop it in the oven you wouldn't believe some of the additional ingredients they come up with i mean ancient aztec juniper berries <laughs> rosemary from the lost city of atlantis i mean it the sky is the limit with with home chef really yeah and you can get them weekly, you can get them bi-weekly, you can skip a week, you can get them every week. So use the link and it will save you $20 off your first box. Orders over $60 ship free. Okay, it's time for campfire. So let's play the campfire intro. Because streaming services are evil corporations that gatekeep bands from their fans and pay them pennies while collecting millions. This is campfire. <laughs> So what we're trying to do here is get behind bands that may or may not yet be on Spotify, but they have a camp. Band camp. I want to call it campfire. Yeah. They have a band camp page. So our campfire number one feature is Evathorn from Attica, Greece. Yes. We're talking obscure raging black metal, folks. Yeah. Their band camp is Devathon, Devathorn. Yeah. Dot bandcamp.com so let's take a look we've got their 2007 album diadema their 2018 split with inferno dasvel Thagurion. i'm getting that wrong their 2013 split with blaze of perdition 418-athiav and their 2010 four-way split secta nova as well as my personal favorite devathorn album veritra the first album, Diadema, which is Greek for crown, that's why there's a crown on it, it's a fine slice of riffy black metal in the vein of Gorgoroth or early Bathory. Their drummer is the secret sauce. Mechblastus. <laughs> I love it. Her real name is Demetra Scorti. I just love how she bashes the simple kit into dust for this record. You can almost hear the sweat hitting the ground, feel the tread wear on the bottom of her sneakers. The blisters forming on her fingers. I'm all excited now. Let's play some Devathorn from the Split with Inferno. This is Azazel Iscariot. Campfire number two. Let's focus on Devathorn's 2015 full length, Vitria. Mm. Vitria is the serpent symbolizing drought, famine, good times. Good times. I gave this thing four out of five before I heard, when I heard the first song. And now, years later, I still stand by it. It's some of the ballsiest, evil, tritone infused, snake charming black metal I've ever heard come out of Greece. Production's a little more robust on this one than the debut. Uh, album's full of a little bit more complete songs and less preludes than the first one. Cuts like the crazed opener, Veritas Universalis. And the venomous ascent zig and zag fluidly between pounding, chugging riff, hell and dissident, ringing interludes to allow the listener to catch up, yeah. i.e. the death spell effect. That's how Omega does that. Yeah. Uh, blazing solos and some nice acoustic interplay woven into the mix, as well as the behemoth effect. Yeah. Vocalist Algathor sounds perfectly willing to give himself a hernia for you. Yes, he is. <laughs> He blows out the microphone with resentless. He blows out the microphone with relentless yells, screams, and the occasional Tom Warrior growl. Ugh. A couple of processional interludes here and there, but overall, the disc is really low on filler, uh, high on blowing out eardrums in service of the Dark Lord. So, I, I'll show some of the. I got the CD here. I'll show some of the gold inlays, and um, this is just really well done. The artwork, I love it. Look, it's very. Um, Paradise Lost mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and let's play a song, Veritas Universalis.
All right, so it's time for our interview with Pat and Brian from Hellwit. We really enjoyed our chat with these guys. Um, if you haven't checked out their videos on YouTube as well as their new music, you should do it. It is super good. All their instruments are red and they kill this one. So uh, here's our little chat so we can find out some- Warning, more. warning. When the lights go out, stay with it. They're in, they're in the middle of a terrible thunderstorm the whole time we're interviewing them, but we never lose it. They just are sitting in the dark for a while here and there. So anyway, take it away. Okay, so we got we got Y and T and Pete Sandoval here. Yeah. yeah. Look at that. No more. Well, yeah, no more terrorizer for a little while. <laughs> at least a couple of years, according to him. The most brutal drummer ever, ever. It didn't yeah. work out. Modern Age is pretty cool too. <laughs> All right. So you're catching us straight off of our Hell in the Harbor two-day bender. So yeah. Hell in the Harbor. It's nice. Oh, cool, cool. Oh, I've heard about them. That, that was a nuts lineup. The only problem was sometimes they had two bands that were going on at the, like the same time or overlapping, and you kind of had to pick. Yeah. So sometimes if somebody big was playing outside, like Pig Destroyer, we would check that out, and we knew, all right, we're going to you know, go in to see Vomit Forth and a little bit inside because we wanted to set, catch some of the newer stuff. And I tell you, they were good, really good too. So it was great. You know, bands, some bands we talked to, they fuss so much over image and backdrop and stage show. Cannibal Corpus doesn't even have the whole word. They just have canna, that's it. <laughs> they don't even bother to fit it into the frame. Like if you don't know who the fuck we are, then why are you here? You know, so yeah, yeah. They don't great. Know <laughs> okay so so hopefully they're doing it again next year as well as maryland death fest and maybe we'll get uh get you guys yeah, out great to that you guys festival. did yeah some hell witch yeah 40th anniversary that would be nice yeah oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, hell's harbor hell in the harbor hell in the harbor hell's, hell's harbor. harbor hell's harbor bangers so originally Pat, I guess you're going to have to answer this. How did the band originally come together? Way back when. Well, the uh, um, I went to the University of Florida, and uh, my college roommate. We also went to high school together, and uh, we went both went from you know South Florida High School to University of Florida, which is in Northern Florida in Gainesville. And we were both tape traders. We were both heavily into the underground, and um, I was you know getting decent on the guitar I you know I mean I had been playing about four years maybe but never took any lessons but I was starting to get decent on the guitar and he said why don't we uh like why don't you write a song and we'll record a song and I'm like he didn't he didn't play any instrument he, you know but he was really into it and he was very creative and he was very you know just just a fan hardcore fan of, of underground metal right. and um so we worked it out where he came up with the title Nosferatu, okay. and then we both kind of wrote the lyrics, and he said, okay, come up with a beginning riff, and then he's like, all right, well, he said, like, come up, uh-oh, are you there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're having potential storms right now, and the power's going on and off. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. Okay. Uh, cool, but, uh, but uh, how fitting, but um, <laughs> yes, um, he, you know, we, we both wrote the lyrics, and then... Um, he said, come up with a part for the beginning. And then he said, you know, where it goes Nosferatu, come up with a guitar part that goes with that. And so, you know, I spent a couple minutes and came up with the, the chorus riff. And then um, he said, now come up with a solo riff. And it kind of went like that. And yeah. we put it together. And then, uh, you know, I had two cassette decks. So with two cassette decks with lines in, uh, you can record two microphones on the left channel, you know, or bounce two microphones to a left channel and then two more microphones to the right channel. And uh, not to make it overly technical, but we made the left channel guitar and drums. And then the right channel was the other guitar and him singing. And as I said, he didn't play any instruments. So we took our kitchen chair, which was like a, you know, vinyl seat cushion, yeah. you know, 70s style chair. And we take the microphone right to the cushion. And then on the other, you know, on the same cushion next to it, we taped a little paperback book. And he had two drumsticks and he went da, 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 like that. And I so have the CD that's got that on it. Yeah, the compilation you put out. Yeah, okay. I remember the story. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, he did the drums and I yeah, did yeah. it. And then we did it. And I said, yeah, that's, that was, that's funny. It's cool. It's funny, whatever. And um, he's like, yeah, no, that's good. I go, yeah, I go, it's, it's, it's funny. And I said, don't give that to anybody. <laughs> and he immediately gave it to people. Uh, uh, so I was upset about that. And then uh, within a month, we started getting mail and addressed to Hellwitch. And I was like, really? I'm like, what, what do you, you know, what do you want? What could you possibly want? And uh, guys were writing saying, tell us about the band. Tell us about this. Tell us about you know, when, when are you doing more songs. When you... And so at that point, I realized that it was, it was probably worth pursuing. And uh, so, yeah, it kind of went from there. The getting the mail kind of, you know, prompted me to kind of keep going. Because really, I, I, I wasn't thinking it was anything. And I wasn't even thinking it was going to do anything or be anything. And yeah. it didn't That's do much. That's a great story. Me. Yeah. So that was it. And then, oh, you know, within six months of that, I met other guys who went to UF and one was a drummer beginning to learn drummer and the other was a guitar player. Um, and I let them, they weren't into the underground scene, but they were into like Dio and, you know, Sabbath oh, yeah. and, and all that. And I turned them on to Slayer and Venom and, you know, Angel Witch and, uh, you know, all the good stuff of those days. Right. And they, they immediately switched over to that kind of music and i'm like yeah you know let's i go i have this song and this band i'm like you know why don't you guys why don't we three get together and come up with some more songs and and then it really started with real musicians then that was probably um maybe march of 85 and the demo thing in the living room was october of 84. wow oh wow yeah that's great yeah that story reminds me we had we're passing like a street musician and he was playing drums on basically Home Depot buckets. And he was going to town. And I was like, wow. But Mark said he's like, he's more a double bucket guy. So. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, if he starts to play double bucket, he can look us up. You know. Drummers out there that are, that are the street performers. I appreciate that sort of thing as a drummer. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Lots of cool YouTube videos. Some of those guys are really good. Oh, yeah. You don't need you know, the top of the line of equipment, you know, there's, there's fucking great videos of these kids in, in uh, less fortunate countries that are playing, you know, homemade drum sets. And they're, you know, it's, yeah. I got the the drive to do it. Yeah. Um, we, we interviewed, uh, Jean Paul oh, from Jean Paul from clutch. And he was talking about when they toured with Sepultura and when he was talking to Igor, Igor from Sepultura told him that, uh, for the first uh, album, album and or first EP and album, he they they didn't know what double bass was. So like, he at some point like two albums in, somebody showed him here's a double bass, and he had to learn it, even though he was already you know established in Sepultura. It's crazy, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. So Brian, you joined in 2015. How did you guys come to together? Yeah. Well, uh, I was 18 years old at the time. Um, I was playing in some local bands, uh, kind of just starting out, you know, playing in bands at all. And, uh, I was a fan of Hellwitch. I'd seen Pat around, you know, we had a lot of mutual friends and we saw each other at, you know, gatherings and at some shows and, you know, started talking a little bit. And, uh, well, I, when I became, when I first got to know Pat, uh, he actually wasn't that interested in doing Hellwitch anymore. He told me that, you know, he was having some issues with uh, their drummer and uh, was like, you know, I, I find a lot more uh, joy out of watching movies these days, you know, rather than playing music. <laughs> and I, was, I remember talking to him and, and like walking away from that conversation, like kind of feeling sad, like, <laughs> like, man, what a... a, a great cool legendary old school band you know and like that's yeah. you know, what what the state that they're in and uh then you know one day uh i got a text message from pat i remember saying what would you think of playing drums for Hellwitch?" and at that point i was like i can try you know i i, I never played <laughs> i was always a heavy metal drummer but uh i never played extreme metal at that point I never played blast beats at that point. And okay. I was like, I can try, but oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. 
it, it yeah. is kind of cool. It does add kind of a cool element. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I, want to, I said, you know what? I, I'm going to try, you know? And I walked in and I did the best I could. I at least learned the structures of the songs and played them like, you know, as fast as I could, you know, to the best of my ability. And it probably, you know, looking back, wasn't very good, but uh, it was good enough, I guess, because, you know, sometimes I've learned, and this is great advice for anyone who wants to be a musician, having the right attitude goes a long way. You know, it, even if you don't have the exact chops that you need for a gig, if you're, if you establish that you're willing to work on it and work with the band, you know, that in itself can go a really long way. And I was willing to learn, you know? So they were willing to work with me. Pat and I sat and he taught me the songs and I, I went home, I learned the structures and I learned, you know, as much as I could on my own and I would come in and we'd work it out together, the, the kinks. And then here we are uh, in 2023. Yeah. Uh, I think I've been in the band, what, eight, eight years now. So that's how it started. And uh, I owe a lot to Hellwitch for improving my abilities as a drummer uh, because I wasn't even a quarter of the drummer before I had to learn these parts. So yeah, I'd say it worked out pretty well. I was so. listening to the promo for the new album. I was flipping back and forth between that and Terra Symmetry. And it is, you have, it's like you guys never changed. It's exactly the same. Yeah. I mean, the, a lot of it's your screaming, but still, I mean, it's, there's no gap, you know, yeah. it's I, the same, it's the same style. It's great. Yeah. You haven't missed a step at all. What I like to hear, you know, what I like to write and what I like to listen to. And, you yeah. know, I, I don't really think about what uh, people think, you know, I just kind of do it for myself. Exactly. You have to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, I understand. Yeah. So back when you took that hiatus, like in 2004, and then you kind of came back after that, was it similar circumstances that kind of affected like that kind of return and then this latest return after a little gap? Um, really not. It wasn't the same. We, we returned in 2004, you know, and then a, a, that was after six years. But um, when J Brian joined, we were actually we had just finished playing shows in Orlando and I think Tampa and we were driving home with our drummer and I'm in the back. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And he I said something about playing more shows in the near future. And he said, Oh, okay. <laughs> and he said, you guys are, you're lucky. I feel so sorry for you guys. <gasps> I, 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 I almost like opened his door and pushed him out of the car. <laughs> on I'm in the back and I texted Brian within 60 seconds. And I, I said, I, I gotta, you know, I gotta do something right now. I gotta do something. I can't, I cannot play with this guy ever again. There's yeah, just yeah. no, way. No, there's just no way. Can't do it. And, and, you know, <laughs> incidentally, when we took our long hiatus, it was kind of the same reason due to the same person. Oh, so cool. that I, I saved the band from another hiatus. Uh, <laughs> well, we're glad you did. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I was ready to start asking, you know, people in the scene and Brian, I, you know, Brian had come to most of our shows and hung out at the merch table and was always talking with me and gave me his number. We exchanged numbers and I'm yeah. like, he's a good dude. I'm like, he's not, you know, he's not fucked up. He's not a fucking drunk. He's not a fucking you know, stoner, stoned all the time. And he was always really uh, on the ball. So I figured, uh, yeah, Brian was the guy for us. Yeah, no, that's great. Brian, did you stylize your sound off of anyone in particular? Or is it just what you learned or a blend? Rob Reiner from Anvil. Yeah. Uh, they, that's the reason I, that's, you know, what made me say I wanted to play drums. And, uh, yeah, you know, in everything that I do, you know, I I, I kind of hear, you know, maybe not everyone else will hear it, but, you know, I know my own playing. So I hear little things here and there, and I always hear the same influences. And a lot of it goes back to Anvil, believe it or not, uh, and a lot of my fills. And uh, I'd say Nick Menza was also a big influence. Oh, yeah. Um, Dave Lombardo, obviously. Uh, yeah, 
Did you, Brian, very personal question. Did you cry during the Anvil documentary? Did you? Uh, no, I did Did you get not. misty? A lot of us did. Emotional. Nothing wrong with it. I in the theaters when it came out. Um, part, when, when they turn the corner in Japan and that place is packed, it's like, give me a minute. <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 Because it's um, just so heart wrenching before that, like where he's delivering the stuff to the schools, and it's like, oh, God, you know. Yeah. And when he's driving around to record labels, it's like, oh, you know, that's so 1980, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's the story of many a band. I mean, yeah, Raven did almost exactly the same documentary uh, a few years yeah. ago. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, they opened the floodgates for a, a ton of documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. Now every every underground band, not everyone, but a lot of them. A lot of them. Um, the sad story, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those, those stories, they're, they're you know they're all kind of the same. Um, they're interesting if you like the band, uh, you know. But uh, I, I kind of feel the same way about all these music biopics that are that have come out in the last several years, starting with the Queen, and then Motley Crue movie, and then the Elvis movie, and I'm like, okay, calm down. You know, yeah, like, I know. <laughs> they take a lot of liberties with those things too. You know, so you know. But yeah, you, know, you can only watch so many stories of a uh, guy grows up poor, makes it big. Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe because I've been in a band, been in bands my most of my life. I guess it's kind of redundant to me. Maybe it's more. Maybe they're not for me. I don't know. You know, the thing with me, like I, there's that, there's a, there's been a couple of like heavy metal shows on Netflix that they've tried to launch. I forget the name of the one. It's supposed to be like a death metal thing, but they always have to make the heavy metal guys like outcasts and losers. And that's not true anymore. You know what I mean? You can be a, 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 a normal person that has a social life and be in a heavy metal band, but they never want to make it that way because that's not sexy. You have to always be like the show, like they're, you're always getting beaten up by jocks and stuff like that. It's not like that anymore. You know, it's like they just can't let go of that narrative from 1983. You know, it's like, give me a break. You know, did you see the one on the mentors? Uh, yeah, the mentors documentary. That's interesting. I bought that, uh, the, the El Duce yeah. DVD on Arrow Video, and I have not watched it yet. I bought it like a few months ago, and I oh, it's great. It. Yeah. Uh, not watched it yet but um i i have not seen our cat this is our cat vladimir I... why are you here <laughs> cool sorry about that yeah it was um i he i hadn't heard of him up to that point and he had me watch that documentary and it was really good but it was kind of like a train wreck it was like oh my god they just didn't care which is a good thing <laughs> which is a positive thing yeah anyway all right um... so bring it back around to hell witch um in your opinion, I mean, I love that kind of chromatic melodic guitar and the thrash beats, and I love your vocals. What would you say defines the quintessential Hell Witch sound? Uh, I would say uh, being very aggressive and not letting up, being kind of relentless and making sure that it doesn't sound like riffs you heard from another band. Very, That's very probably the key the cornerstones of hell which very cool i did notice that listening to you guys in headphones that sometimes things would be over here and sometimes things would be over yeah, here like hard yeah like yeah. the hard panning okay yeah i i uh we spent so long recording it i don't really listen to it anymore <laughs> i know what you mean you got to separate from it after a while it was six, six, seven months, six or seven months to record an Annihilational Intersension. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really, I haven't really listened to it in a while now. Yeah. What were the main factors like when you were writing those songs that influenced that? Um, like, is it different now than it was back, back in the 80s in terms of writing? Yeah. Pardon? Is it different writing now? What are the differences of writing this type of music now than back in the day, you know, I guess? Well, the interesting thing about the album is the new album is uh, it contains riffs and parts that go back to 1985, 6, 85, 85. Uh, so this album, 
in particular, you can really see how much or how little the band has changed over the years because there is stuff on there spanning the entirety of the band's lifespan. There's a couple songs on there, uh, Hell Witch, uh, which was a song that was never finished that uh, was on tape in 1985. And uh, then there was uh, Torture Chamber, which was on one of the earliest demos. And then there's a couple songs on there that uh, were done in the 90s. And like Anthropophagy is one of those, but it never really got a proper uh, recording or release. And then there's new songs, which uh, are like Delegated Disruption and Solipsistic Immortality. So really, you get the whole band, the band's entire history on this record, which is yeah. pretty cool, I think. I figured that when I saw there was a song called Hell Witch. I went back through all your stuff that I have, and I was like, I don't remember there being a song called Hell Witch. And I thought, this has got to be from like the demo that never was or something, you know. No. Yeah, it was, a, it was a, a, bed, a bedroom recording I did of, again, using the two cassette deck uh, method as we did with the Nosferatu demo, where right. I did two guitars and vocals and solos, and that was it. And I just shelved it. I thought it was really lame, and I was like, "Yeah, this sucks." I'm like, "I'm not, I'm not going to bother." I'll do something new. But everything that's, that came in 1985 was on retro in 2023. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. <laughs> to that, um, writing then, it really wasn't as thought of. I didn't really think about it as much as I do now now there's so much you know going on and there you know there, with the internet there's so many bands that i really take my time and i'll come up with five riffs and i'll keep maybe one and i'll give it the test of like i'll come back to the riffs like in five days and do they still sound good or or do i come back and say oh man that's not really anything it's just kind of there and yeah, so know. i only use the stuff where i can come back and it still has a spark to it. And that's what we'll use in the songs now. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I was also enjoying your um, videos, especially um, the delegation disruption one. I noticed the strings on your guitar were super long on the end on that red guitar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gonna poke somebody in the eye. Yeah. Exactly. Like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that the weapon. He you know. was it performing that for the video. Pardon? How was it when you were performing that for the video? It was uh, it was a little rough because I I had uh, this nail gear thing that I don't wear on stage because it's really heavy. It's many pounds, and um, it was pretty bulky. And I had you know the bullets on, and you know having all the gear on and leather pants in a warehouse. Yeah. You know, that was air conditioning. It was it was kind of rough. It was kind of rough. And, you know, fortunately, the guys, the producers were, you know, the video were like, don't worry, you don't have to hit everything exact, exact. We'll line it up. We'll make it all fit. It'll look perfect. And, you know, because I'm like, man, I can't play this part exactly like on the album with all this shit on. And yeah. like they're like, don't worry. They're like, dude, just do it close. It'll look perfect. And I think it does. It did. Yeah. I, I love the red in your face too when they just zone in and with the red light. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> good yeah, idea. I, yeah, I had a. I wore a bullet belt to Hell in the Harbor, and cool. I was gone for a while to go to the bathroom. And I came back and I said to Stacey, "I said our Lord and Savior Lemmy never told us how hard it is to piss with a bullet belt on. It's a pain." So, FYI, cover it when you're wearing your guitar, or you'll you'll rash up. Exactly. Yeah. Here's, anyway, here's what else we figured out. Bullet belt did not go very well with fishnets because I kept getting stuck on his bullet belt. Right. So we had to walk far away from each other. You would think those two things would be like a marriage made in hell, but they're not. Yeah. That's a that's a good uh, one. That's in the bullet belt. Yep. Hadn't yeah. considered. So I was also kind of like, your I would call you would say oh, you actually came up with this a uh, the the thesaurus the from hell metal genre yeah thesaurus ah. thrash yeah I like that yeah I used to say uh, hell which is like the Shakespeare of heavy metal <laughs> <laughs> yeah your song titles are so, alone are so clever I mean most of them when the new one sent me running to the dictionary like solo solopistic solipsistic immortality I'm like all right I need 
Google for this. Right, right. Some of those words you won't find in the dictionary. Yeah. A lot of the lyric words are I created, you know, to be more specific than the word itself actually, you know, provides. So there's some made up, but most of the titles are, uh, you know, real. Most of them. <laughs> Yeah, because they actually had two definitions for solipistic, one meaning self-centered and the other meaning like that self can be all, that's all you need to exist. So I was kind of wondering which one you meant. Yeah, well, I I um, actually first read about that, you know, uh, in something online about philosophy and it, but what it boiled down to was like, do you really know what's like out of your vision at the moment. I mean, like outside this room right now, is that all really out there right now? And some believe that, no, it, it kind of, you know, when you go out there, it materializes right when you're there and it's not really there. Like everything you don't actually see may not really exist. And uh, I kind of interpreted that in a way where like, well, you know, I mean, maybe someone could live forever if they, you know, did something or you, you didn't really know, you know, if you're not, if you, if you do this or do that, like you may not ever die. You could like live forever. Technically, if you, you know, believe in that and take it to like a sci-fi kind of level. Right. Like the choose your own adventure books. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that like, where's Waldo? <laughs> it was like, remember those books where it would be like, if you decide to go through the door, go to page 36. If you decide not to go through the door, go to page 99. Yeah, they were, they they were, were books yeah, in the 80s. Yeah, I remember. Kind of got more of the Matrix yeah. out of that. Yeah, yeah. Or the Truman Show. Oh, the Truman Show. Remember the Truman Show where everywhere he went, there was like a guy drinking a beer. And he's like, am I, am I supposed to be acting like a doctor right now? Yeah. And it'd be like, cue squirrel. I feel like that every Q morning. Cue squirrel, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then I had a question about uh, megalopatic confine because that title seems almost like an oxymoron because it means an urban area, but on the flip side, confined. So how do you pull that one together? Uh, well, uh, you know, I mean, you have the word megalopolis, which is a real word. Yeah. And so, I mean, to describe the state of a megalopolis is a megalopolyptic confine in you're kind of, it's about pretty much life in South Florida, where it's one big city for what, like 80 miles from West Palm Beach to South Miami on the East Coast of our state. It's all one big city. There is no break. There is no, you know, it's, it's all buildings the whole way. And uh, it's pretty crazy. You know, it's pretty crazy. And um, it's, it's annoying most of the time. And uh, I, uh, whoa, there we go. Uh oh, no. Cool. Well, you could at least hear us. Yes. Uh, <laughs> get a flashlight. Yeah. <laughs> they know you're there. Oh, yeah. can I find it? That's a good question. Can you? Uh, can we cut this for a second? We have to cut. This you, you can leave it on. We can just leave it. Wait, there, oh, there you go. You're back. We, yeah. we have editing. Don't worry. Yeah, we can edit. Don't worry. Alan liked it. I'll job. fix it in the mix, as they say. Um, but yeah, so I mean, megalopolyptic confine is about, uh, you know, the tortures of living with the. Uh, a lot of people and most of whom suck and should be dead. That's where all the retirees go. They all go to South Florida and pretend it's not hot. No. Yeah. yeah, something, something. The scooters, the sco I'm sure you have a lot of scooters. I like to call it North South America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have a job where I have to deal with the public, you know, so he gets to oh. hear my stories every day. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, so this one, yeah. uh, June 11th, you will be playing, um, the cycle of miscreancy in its entirety for the first time ever at the St. Vitus bar. So were the songs all like, did you have to go over it again or relearn it or was it just there? Actually, um, we have been playing almost the whole album except for one song. So we, ha I had to kind of teach them and refresh myself and teach Brian and, uh, you know, our other band ma mates that, uh, how that one song went and, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty easy. So, yeah, but yeah, we've been playing most of it the whole time, you know, we've been together except for that one song. And now we're going to do it from beginning to end, which we again, never did that either. It's always been, 
you know, peppered into the set with other songs. Yeah, that's going to be really cool. And I'm glad not super hard. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, no, it won't be. Uh, it won't be. <laughs> Those are the easy songs. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the I easy have... songs. Like, I'm, you know, I could play those when I wake up in the morning. But the new ones, that's a little, that's a little different. Yeah. I have a question. What was Wild Rags label like? Because it seemed like every band that went on Wild Rags, the records all of a sudden were worth 400 bucks each. They all became like multiple collector, huge dollar limited things. Was that, a, was that, was that label supportive or what was that like? Um, well, he, you know what he, he was in the beginning. I mean, he was selling our 87 demo wild rags was the name of a record store in California. And the owner of the record store created a label and called it Wild Rags, Richard C. And um, he was selling, I would send him, you know, back in the cassette days, um, you'd buy a box of 12 blank cassettes and I'd mail him a box of 12 and he'd sell them in a couple weeks and he'd send me the money and I'd mail him another box of 12. And then uh, one day a mutual acquaintance told me, he says, you know, Richard wants to sign your band. And I was like, really? He didn't he didn't ask me. And he's like, well, he told me he would he would like to. So I wrote to Richard and said, hey, you know, you wanna you wanna hear a Hell Witch album? You wanna get that going? And uh he was like, Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um we signed with Wild Rags, and um I started <laughs> well, I mean, soon after you know, we were on the label and the album came out, which the good thing is it did it came out worldwide, like I had. Get, was getting fan mail from Europe in 90, you know, guys saying, oh, I bought your CD yeah. in the record store here in Sweden or wherever. And right. um, so he pressed it in the United States on vinyl and cassette only. And then in Europe, it was CD and vinyl only. So there's actually two vinyl pressings and the only cassette is the U.S. Wild Rags and the only CD is the European Wild Rags. And yeah, he had like, not, not his office, but he had a partner in Europe who you took the name Wild Rags and the logo and they kind of were partners, I guess. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but, you know, then it came out and um, it came time for our first royalty payment. And, you know, I was getting mail saying I bought your CD in, in Europe and right. you know, it was for sale in a bunch of record stores just in South Florida. Mm -hmm. And he said... I'll never forget this. He said, oh, he said, yeah, you know, because, oh, and before this, he says, oh, he goes, we've shipped probably about 10 to 12,000 units. And I'm like, cool, cool. And then when it came time to get paid, he said, oh, I, uh, those, I, uh, most of them got returned. He goes, yeah, he goes, they oh ordered. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like, I, you know, I, I don't, you, I, you don't have any money coming. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was pissed. I talked to Enrique from Sadistic Intent. I don't know if you've heard of them. Oh, I know them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Enrique from Sadistic Intent. And I, he and I would talk and he said, man, he's, he's ripping us off. And I'm like, he's ripping us off too. And <laughs> Enrique started a campaign to expose him for what he was as, you know, expose right. what he was doing. And, um, I was on this, there were a dozen bands at least and distros on this flyer he made about mm -hmm. Wild Rags being a ripoff. And um, of course, Richard saw it and he's like, you're off, you're done. Hell, which is done. I'll never, you'll never see a penny from me. And uh, that was kind of the end of it with him. And we were like, that's, I was like, that's fine. We're not, you're not going to do anything for us anyway. You know right. what I mean? Exactly. Well, the yeah. album came out. I'm glad that happened, but you know, you're just going to keep all the money, whatever we sell, you're keeping the money. That's yeah. pretty obvious. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. So then a few years later, I'm not sure when it was somewhere in the nineties, early two thousands, I heard he got, he went to prison for tax evasion. Uh, shocking uh, yeah shocking yeah. Wild Rags, uh, you know ceased to exist and um yeah. and I, I think one of my friends even said he he talks to richard's daughter and she you know did say yeah you know he, he was gone for a little while he had some legal problems and uh you know the 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 label went out and the store closed up and that was the end of it yeah i mean in that you know 
that flies in the face of you know a lot of people that don't know what it's like in the business. They think that being on an indie label is so much more romantic than a major label. But every band I've talked to has said, no, the major labels fucking paid us. We got checks regularly. The indies were the ones that ripped us off, just like wild rags. That's what we hear. Yeah. I mean, some were good, but I hear a lot more good about major labels than, you know, the indies. Like your wild rags story. But yeah, you know, like Brian said, it is case to case because I was friends, you know, still am with Mark from Impetigo and they were on Wild Rags um, right, you know, when we were mm. and they never had a problem. He sent them money. He he took, you know, he honored his agreement with them completely, but they were a big seller. So I think that might have, you know, yeah. Yeah. you know, I don't know how many, but I'm sure Richard made a good amount of money on, you know, from their releases, probably more than he made yeah. from ours. So always rubbed me the wrong way. He did that blood come demo and it was like Tom Araya's son's band, but he couldn't leave it at that. He had, he had to make it say he, he lied about on the label. It said there were two Slayer kids in the band and it was really just one. Araya and Joey Hanneman. Hanneman, right. It always rubbed me the wrong way later because I found out later that that was bullshit. And I was like, oh, I mean, this, this is shady, you know. <laughs> One Raya. Slayer offspring is enough. Uh, One of them was a real Slayer yeah, relative. Yeah, right. Was. Yeah. yeah, they had a song on that album called Harassment by Farm Animals. Yeah, I mean, I'll never forget that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to ask you also, all right. So you're in Florida. You're making records at Morris Sound. You're right there with Scott Burns. Why, where was the big day aside money for you? Where was the big, you know, autopsy money for you guys? Why didn't it turn into that? Where was the, why didn't it become a multi-record deal like the other bands that were on Mars Sound at the time? Well, it, we, we were on Wild Rags and it was, <laughs> it was one album and one EP. That yeah. was the contract we had with Wild Rags. Okay. And, you know, we, we um, wanted to go to Morris Sound because, at, at, at that time, you weren't assured of good production. I mean, now we're to the point, I think that, you know, a lot, lot of albums in extreme metal, the production is the same. It's the same drum sound. It's the same right. guitar sound. Like, it's the yeah. same production, which I, I don't think we have. But aside from that, um, yeah, we only were with uh, Wild Rags for one album and one EP. And... I didn't want to take any, we didn't want to take any chances with what we were going to have our first album sound like. So I booked more sound and I said, I said, you know, I can't afford to pay Scott Burns to produce, but could he just be our engineer and record our album? And that was like, you know, he produced it, you know, it that's, like that's what matters, right? Yeah. For sure want to mess with with chancing the sound on the album so we went with more sound and and i mean i think the songs were they were a little bit maybe a little bit went over everyone's heads in 1990 it was maybe because that was what i used to hear i used to hear oh man you know i like Hellwitch, but you're too choppy your songs are too choppy what? You know, was, i'm like dude i'm like it's technical you know it's 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 if you listen to it, I think it sounds good. I think it maybe isn't a flowing, groovy, grooving album, but I'm like, I, I think it sounds good altogether. And that wow. was something I heard more than once is that you guys are good, but there's too many, too many choppy and too much breaks and chops and cha too many changes. Well, I mean, were you, were you like handcuffed to wild rags contractually or, cause I, I, I wonder why you didn't end up on like road racer or something like that, you know, like some of the others, you know? Yeah, we were too choppy, I think, because they, you know, no, we, we did shop to them, but they were not interested at all. Really? That's so weird, because I mean, you guys were so much better than a lot of the bands yeah, they did sign. a lot. So, yeah, anyway. All right, well, I was just curious about that, because I was always like, hell, which should be right there with Deicide and Atheist and, you know, but anyway. I thought it was good, you know, but whatever. I'm biased. <laughs> Yeah, so I also liked um, the lyric video for um, the Solipistic Immortality, and I noticed all the insects and stuff, and I've noticed other bands. What do you think the connection is between, like, this genre and insects? It just seems like it pops up a lot. Well, you know, I 
know, the, the video was made by uh, the same guy who did the engineering on our new record, uh, Jeremy Stoska. Uh, I don't know if there, he was given really any direction. It was just, you know, I, we never made a lyric video before. And uh, just, he, he said he could do it and uh, gave him just a brief summary of what the song's about. And that's what he came up with. And there were a few, there were a few uh, uh, drafts of it that there were some things in there in the first one that didn't really make sense. Like there were like bridges and cities and they looked kind of, <laughs> they had nothing to do with the song. Uh, the song itself is uh, about immortality and death and things of that nature. So uh, when I saw the insects personally, I was like, okay, that makes sense. You know, insects, cause, like that's where all life comes back to, like, you know, the, the insects feasting on the corpses. Yeah. That's yeah. What, that was my personal interpretation when I saw the insects. So uh, yeah. I was like, okay, this seems to be like, you know, you know, like that's what it all comes down to in the end. So, yeah. Uh, and I thought that fit with the, uh, the theme of life and death and everything that's covered in the song. So, yeah. no, I can yeah. relate. I've spent hours on YouTube, uh, tarantula versus tarantula hawk, uh, cobra versus mongoose. I can watch that shit for hours, you know. Just <laughs> wildlife is just brutal, you know. You watch mango worm videos, yeah. What's that? Oh, uh -oh, uh -oh. Like, this might be really bad. What is this? Mango worms, check out mango, mango worms. worms. Okay. Oh, God, yeah. Oh gosh, I think I'm gonna have trouble sleeping the night. Okay. I'll rough you up. <laughs> Maybe they should do gambling bets on mango worm fighting. It's yeah. gonna be big. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a little game that we play. Mm -hmm. I have a hundred questions in front of me. I'm going to ask each of you to pick three numbers. So you'll only have to answer three of my random questions. Uh, uh, it's one to a hundred. Yeah. Any, yep. any number between one and a hundred. Okay. I want one, two, and three. One, two, and three. All right, Brian, what do you, what numbers you picking? I'll do 66, uh, which is one short of six, six, six. Yeah. Uh, and I'll do 45 and short 99. Let's do 99. Cause it's almost six, six, six upside yeah. down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a sponsor take offense to our praise Satan. Oh, that, so, let me yeah, just tell you, right? Ridiculous. So I, I'm always pushing her to go join Facebook groups to promote the show, right? And we did a bit where we were kind of like laughing about some of the funny stuff in the Old Testament, how ridiculous it is. And she <laughs> joined a few groups and they kicked her out. And I was like, why? It, that shit's funny. And they were like, it says praise Satan behind you. I was like, oh, maybe that's... Oops. Okay, well, if you're going to get touchy about it, you know. That's a staple of metal is praise Satan. That's... I'm like, that's Sabrina. She was in the Archies. Give me a break. But they, you know how these Christians are. Anyway. Wow, that's rough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All questions. right, Pat. Number one. What okay. outfit have you worn in the past that you would not wear today? That's a good one. Outfit. My, my 80s stonewash guest jeans. <laughs> A um, let's see, uh, a skull T-shirt. Yeah, no, that was cool. Uh oh, and we're and we're black again. But um, <laughs> uh, let's see. The 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 guest jeans could couldn't wear the guest jeans, and um, I think I had like a really kind of not a really cool kiss t-shirt. I had kind of a lame kiss t-shirt at one point that I wore in middle school. So yeah, not the guest jeans and not the lame kiss t-shirt. Was it with makeup? Oh yeah, back, you know, when I was young and they, they, they that wasn't even considered. They're, them taking off their makeup was never even, you know, yeah. was sacrilege. Yeah. Somewhere my brother has a picture of me in parachute pants with the Pete Way Target oh, shirt on. Ooh. I'm sure he's going to extort me one day. You know, he'll put it on the internet. You know. 
All right, number two, if you could eradicate a TV show or movie from existing, which one would you pick? There's so many horrible TV shows and movies. Boy, that's rough. That's why it's a tough question on that. Yeah. Probably um gotta be a romantic comedy. Yes. Okay. Would probably I mean, I don't know a lot of those, you know, like I don't know, legally blonde. There you go. I've never <laughs> seen it, but I just I know it sucks and I just hate it just from instinct. There you it. go. That's a good one. All right. Number three. Have you ever failed at anything? And if so, what? In fourth grade, I failed a math quiz and it was very, very traumatizing for me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel your pain. They used to make us do those timetable tests. And everybody had a race car. And once you pass like the ones, the twos, the threes, they would move your car. Well, my car was stuck back here with my name on it. It was so embarrassing. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> knows you, you suck. Yeah. All right, we're on to Brian number 66. Do you feel like substances like alcohol or drugs enhance or hinder the creative process? Um, if you ask me, Personally, I would say they hinder it. Uh, I believe practice should always be a sober event. Uh, I never drink before hitting the stage or I don't do any drugs. Um, so for me personally, uh, I would say sober is the way to go if you're going to be writing music or doing anything creative. But that's me. And I mean, if, if you uh, ask some other people, they might tell you a whole nother story. Like we might not have some of the best Black Sabbath albums if they were 100% sober. Yeah. So um, yeah, but for me personally, I say it's a hindrance to the process for sure. Well, while we're on the subject, it's a perfect chance for me to say this. Do you know who Burke Shelley is from Budgie, the band Budgie? I've been told I look like him. Yeah, you look just like him. Yeah, you really do. If you played the bass, and the thing about Burke Shelley is they were kind of contemporaries with Sabbath. And I love reading interviews with him because even now or before he died, he would say, we heard paranoid and we thought, obviously someone's heard communication breakdown. Like they didn't give Sabbath any credence at all. They were just like, we're better. And Budgie is the craziest band because they'll be so heavy and then they'll go off into La La Land and then they'll come back. I mean, they're, they're crazy band. Yeah, but so if you get some bell bottoms, you could be Burke Shelley. I did play bass on one track on the new Hollywood track. All right, there you go. Yeah, so uh, very good. Way. On the way. Go. All right, so I'm glad that I'm not the only one that thinks that. It's great. Yeah. We're black again. Uh oh, black, black into the end. Well, playing at the level you play at, I I can't imagine being messed up at all. No, trying to do that. playing that fast. Good lord. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it really in for Hellwitch. Yeah, I mean, I used to, you know, in the 80s, I smoked weed before practice and I thought I was playing better, but mm. it wasn't the case. <laughs> I thought I was playing better. Oh, there we go. Okay. Now we got a little bit of light. Okay. Um, number 45. If you could commit a crime and get away with it, what would it be? say it, I, I probably won't get away with it. When I do it. <laughs> it's an oxymoron, yeah. You could you could do the basic instinct thing. Obviously, that would be my alibi. Why would I announce myself as the killer? Right. Um, what crime would I commit? I don't know. Uh, speeding. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, Brian. That's Brian. Yep. I love I, it. Heavy foot on the gas pedal. Yeah. All right. Uh, 99. What advice, what advice would you give your teenage self? My teenage self, um, keep doing what you're doing <laughs> because, uh, I think that while I did get, uh, pretty discouraged a lot, I stuck with everything I did in the end and I've had a 
pretty good career up to this point in music, I think. And I'm pretty happy with where I'm at. So uh, persistence. Yeah. That's what I tell anybody who's trying to, you know, make it in this world of music or really anything. Persistence is key. And uh, I, I think I kind of knew that inside. Either that or I was just really stubborn. So, because, uh, you know, like what 16, 17 year old is going to, you know, says, oh, I'm going to make it in the world of heavy metal no matter what, you know, yeah. I don't think you hear it. A lot of teenagers saying that, but uh, yeah, keep doing what you're doing because uh, I am very happy that I stuck with all of my dreams and all of my goals and work towards accomplishing them. So yeah, yeah, it's all about persistence, you know. Yeah, it takes grit. It takes grit, you know? and you're gonna get told no more times than you want to probably hear. Yep, you gotta exactly. just stay the course. Um, so you guys are about to kick off a tour. Um, it looks like you're coming close to us, but it's still about two and a half hours away, Salisbury. Yeah. Um, and then a European tour. Um, where are you most excited to play? Well, we're not doing, we don't have a European tour plan. We have uh, one festival in Berlin, Germany. Okay. Uh, the ah. festival that's in December. Uh, we also have a couple other festivals within the United States. We would like to get a European tour going if we can get any more dates uh, after that festival in uh, in Germany. We'd love to. So if any promoters are listening, you know. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I'm most excited for the Berlin show because I mean I've um you know I've been to Asia and you know Thailand and whatnot, but never to Europe. So this will be the first time Hell which has been in Europe. Yeah, it's cool. Like I, I remember when I when I got that destruction live without sense album and I heard that German crowd and I was like, this would never happen in the United States. This is amazing. Gave, Gave, Gave. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. They're serious over there. Yeah. yeah. Big time. Yeah. So if you could make a lineup like to tour with, and this is a fantasy lineup, they can be together, not together. Who would you pick to go on tour with? I would pick Devastation from Chicago, Insanity from California, and Slaughter from Toronto. Wow, three really obscure ones. I like it though. The four bill <laughs> package with Hellwitch. I whatever. I, I yeah. can I add more? <laughs> is this is this the tour we'd like to see or a tour with Hellwitch? I'll go on later or earlier, whatever needs to be if I could add more. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all I mean, we all know the devastation from Texas kind of sucked, didn't they? I mean the talking vocals and the one from Chicago was so much better. Oh my yeah, God. The one from Chicago is one of my favorite things. That's in life. the one. Yeah. Uh, for me, I'd say I've been fortunate to tour with a lot of my heroes. So um, at this point, I would say I'd like to tour with uh, Iron Maiden oh, wow. or tour with Metallica. You know, I think it's time oh, okay. that they stop bringing the five finger death punches of the world out to these major stages and, you know, give some uh, chances to the younger bands and the more underground bands that, uh, there we go. Uh, the more underground bands that are fighting, you know, to be heard. So yeah, I'd like to tour with uh, Metallica or Iron Maiden. I saw an Iron Maiden cover band not that long ago, and they had the looks and the move, and it was all, what, six of them? Six of them. They were on, like, a stage that was this big. <laughs> so it was like they had a really tough job trying to emulate Iron Maiden in the current era without being able to move. I felt really bad for them. <laughs> uh. So I have to say we both really love this album yeah, as we well as – I mean, do people's, I'm sure people still ask for Nosferatu, right? Of course. That's the one. That's yeah. the hit. But uh, there's so much good stuff here. I really hope you guys, as soon as you know, well, if you could get to Baltimore eventually, it'd be nice. Yeah. It would be. Yeah. It's yeah. funny. We're going to play Baltimore on the Monday after, after the show in New York City on Sunday, but 
uh, one of our band members could not do that and miss work another day, so we couldn't do the Monday in Baltimore. Understood. Understood. Yeah, I know. You gotta, you gotta make a limit. I know. Depot one time uh, some years back. Um, yeah, I think in 2018 we played in Baltimore. Yeah, that was good. That was a good show. We'll we'll come back. But yeah, yeah, thinking for 40th anniversary. Yeah, we'll Next try year. to. Yeah, we'll try to do a lot of stuff. Definitely, yeah, it's been a lot because yeah, it's been a long time since Elvis has things. been to the the uh, West Coast. Yeah. So uh, I think it's about time we're going to try, hopefully, to get something going for more of an extensive U.S. tour. Very good. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. the reception would be super great. You yeah, know, I especially so. now, I think your your timing is flawless. Yeah. So yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, we are. Thank you. I appreciate we appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the, the album from, you know, I mean, what I can see on at least on YouTube, like it's getting more views than other stuff we have on YouTube. So maybe, uh, yeah, you know, maybe the time is now. And if I it's not. It. No. Yeah. Well, maybe I can't figure it out. I can't figure out what does well and what doesn't on social media. It is so much beyond me. Like I was on Spotify, the, the number one Slayer song streaming on Spotify is Repentless. I would have never thought that. Yikes. I know. Yeah. yeah. That's that's only half the band. But whatever. Whatever. Don't get me started, right? You know. Put out by, you know, the whatever label they're on now. I'm not sure which one, but uh, it gets added to the playlist. The labels get it added to the playlist. That's what the record labels do now. And Oh, look, so you pay enough so you can get it moved up. Okay. I, I, you tell I'm me so that proud. people are choosing repentless over angel of death. That's a bunch of bullshit. Come on. Yeah, it's it's the fact that that they're getting added to playlists and wow. people put on the top hot new metal playlist, and that's what the you know the bigger band you are or the more what I don't I'm not really sure how they're curated. A lot yeah. of it's done by AI. Some of it's done by of just the powers that be, I don't yeah, know. Spotify doesn't want us to know any of this stuff. That's the thing. They're like an evil empire. Have yeah. You the AI DJ on Spotify. Yeah. It's, it's really crazy. It's remarkably accurate. Yeah. You know, at first it was playing me all this indie stuff, and finally he was like, "No, I think metal's more your thing." Here's some metal from Wisconsin. I was like, "Okay, thanks." Mine said something that's never been said by any DJ ever. He goes. Yo, Mark, we're going to start off this morning with some Burzum. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's never been said. Yeah. Well, we're wondering how do you get how do how do you get the AI DJ to pick you? Can you imagine the money you have to pay for that? My God, you know. I like I said, I don't really know how one hundred percent how it works. But like that's I'm still something I'm trying to figure out myself. Uh, but uh, I'm starting to understand it more than I ever have. Because uh, I'm more of an old school soul with, you know, the, yeah, buy albums. Yeah. But the masses like to stream. And really, what it all comes down to is it's do you get added to the playlists? That's what gets you the, 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 the listens on these platforms. And yeah. it's just a matter of finding your way on there. Well, we also kind of thought about that we went out of our way to kind of incorporate you know instead of just listening to that we also do a band camp feature like people who aren't even on spotify or are just on spotify right. to kind of highlight some of these other band bands. Camp is so much better for the bands i mean it's just yeah. it's, you know you control you get so much more of the actual money and you you actually get to talk to your fans and you know who bought your t-shirts and stuff it's so, much, so much better yeah which hell which does have a band camp uh, hellwitch.bandcamp.com. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, keep killing us with all those red instruments. I see those gorgeous drums behind you. Yes. Lots of cymbals. Woo! Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is that double hi hats back there? Is that what you got? Going on? One hi hat. But, uh, yeah. Okay, one. Hellwitch logo. Yeah. I like that. Very, I love it. Zazzed up. All zazzed up. Zazzed up. <laughs> Put it on the first train to Zazzville. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, gents. I appreciate it. Okay, Sounds of Decay 1 is Immortal's new album that just dropped, War Against All. 
you know, somehow with the lawsuits, the band exits, the trademark filings, Immortal has somehow become like the journey of black metal. <laughs> um, this is the 10th Immortal record. Demon Oz has taken over and he's listed as the only actual member of the band. So um, he's recruited Ice Dale, who we love, from Enslaved and Audrey Horn for guitar and session drummer Kevin Cavalli. Yeah, it almost looks like he's doing the the single man band thing with him being the only member, but I'm sure that will change. Yeah. How much money does Immortal make where they're doing all this fight? I mean, I get the jury thing. I don't get that. I think it's, it's a pride or a personal thing or, or who did what. You know, people get funky with... Gorgoroth, I think, had this too uh, for a while. It wasn't nearly as dramatic as Immortal. But anyway, you go ahead. So the question is, is Demonos and his black magic band any good? Let's say this. Can they do justice to the band's back catalog? And can he alone pull off the perpetual corpse-painted frown? Mm. It seems he's provided everything an immortal fan would need. Songs are, pat uh, songs are packed with tasty riffs, maiden-esque guitar fills, double-violent bass, voiced grooves, and his signature frosty gurgle over it all. So the old timers are already bitching about a lineup, but I, I mean, I got to say, despite the changes, this is really is an excellent black metal record. Um, I compared it to the old stuff. It's good. Quick strikes like War God and No Sun struck their grim crunch quite swimmingly, I'd say. Both tracks are very conducive to headbanging. Uh, there's some longer epic cuts like Nordlander, which offers an iron gallop that dances convincingly with some folk infused fallaway segments, just like the old stuff. Uh, it builds over seven minutes. I mean, now there's not really anything that challenges classics like tragedies, blows at a horizon, but Ice Dale is no slouch. Um, he lends considerable heft to the wall of guitar presented here. Um, Demon Oz doesn't take any chances with the band's signature sound. There's nothing experimental. And I say he delivers an album that still may end up on some top tens at the end of the year. I took the liberty of Printing a picture. Yes, from of his, It's just him, of course. He's so grim. With his stank face. So, you know, coming soon on Nuclear Blast, a collaboration with Journey's Greg Raleigh and the <laughs> Dean Man, and we'll call it Trade Mark of the Beast. What do you think of that? I like it. Let's right, sell it. Let's play a song. This is War God. Okay. All right. We're up to Sounds of Decay number two. This is To Descend with their album, Mindless Birth. Quite the album cover, full of red and orange and violence. Yes, we are bombarded by millions of choices these days. Everyone has a hundred flavors, dozens of additional options and customizable services. But sometimes you just want a standard size, coffee, regular flavor. Coffee black. No attachments, no preservatives, no monogrammed carrying case. To Descend are a Swedish five-piece, all of whom have been in a ton of bands you've probably never heard of. Yeah, bass player Raga Johnson is also in the Leper Colony album, another must-have that we featured last year. Yes. Or this year, actually. Just no BS, old-school death metal crusher, just like this album. It's a short EP, and it's just pure cannibal obituary-style death metal, the way they used to make it back in the early 90s. Not overly technical, no post-rock elements, no saxophones, just incredible riffs and head-pounding drums over the course of maybe 12 minutes. I bought the t-shirt as soon as I heard it. I was like, yo, Mike, HPGD, hook me up. I need it. So um, it, it's kind of silly to look for standouts. It's just such a shorty piece. I think it's like 12 minutes long. But I love Chain to Time. Uh, it's a little bit longer than the others. It's the drum sounds thing. is just massive. The drummer's name is Marcus Rosenquist. He dials up such a powerful double bass tone and the uh, guitar players, Dennis Blomberg's quick strike leads are perfect seasoning to this appetizer of pure riff chunks. It just, my only complaint is that things over so freaking fast. I want a full 35 minutes. Well, you know? Then you just start it from the beginning. <laughs> so get over to HGPD's Bandcamp page and grab a download of this old school bacon cheeseburger and let's hear a song, Parasitic Vision. You can never go wrong with just plain old bacon cheeseburger. Wine red. Don't you dare put it in the fridge. 
All right, this is our Sounds of Decay 3, Chained to the Bottom of the Ocean. This is Obsession Destruction. Yeah. Did you ever notice that when someone says, to make a long story short, it never is. It never is. fucking is. 9,000 turns. We're still talking. Uh, thoughts like these bring us to the Springfield, Massachusetts four-piece, Chained to the Bottom of the Ocean. As you may surmise by the exceptionally long band name taken from a thou song, by the way, yeah. I, that was confirmed in an interview, mm. not our interview, but another interview. Uh, this bunch doesn't do anything quickly. Yeah. Well, how could you with all those chains on their head that they like to perform in? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is their second full length. Uh, it's, again, Obsession Destruction. It's over an hour of crawling seismic downstrokes, anguished screams, and apocryphal lyrics. The good news is the band have truly mastered this style over their six year existence. And like their heroes, Thou and Dystopia, they figured out a formula of how to keep like a 12 minute sludge song from becoming monotonous. They're heavy and engaging. They've gone through great pains to remain anonymous. This is bizarre. Um, the only evidence of the lineup is a live YouTube video and the band image of four faces, like Stacy mentioned, obscured by chains. Uh, apparently these guys aren't interested in being on Jimmy Fallon anytime soon, I guess, but regardless of whatever their mindset is, this is a must hear for fans of the genre. Touches of post-rock hugeness surround the massive riff of Summer Comes to Multiply, an eight plus minute cut that moves from slow to slower to, to well slower <laughs> with crescendos that make Neurosis's Souls at Zero sound as cheery as a Hallmark card. You know, and I will say that the only thing, and I did find an interview online where someone asks them if they're trying to be anonymous, and they say that they're not. Uh, that, but oddly enough, they they don't give any names. They say that they're going to answer the questions as a band because they feel like the band is more important than the individual. They're like the board from Star Trek. So yeah, in fact, there's this super blurry picture on their Facebook page where. You can see that it's four people, but you can't like, see any faces. Like they're on a subway or something. Or a it, it looks like a bus or a train. Bus or train, yeah. So, um, anyway, so despite the fact that they're, they said if you want to meet them, they suggest come on out to a show. They'll meet you. Okay. So, I well, guess. Well, the track that I can't stop spinning is the Chalice. It seems to have it all. You know, drawn out feedback squalls, thrashy up tempo bits, and just a crushing main riff. And my favorite lyric on the album, which is. When I meet my maker, he'll have to kill me twice. <laughs> I fucking love that, right? Great album artwork, too. And they've got a clutch parody t-shirt for sale. I love it. How much would you pay? Yeah. <laughs> I would say this is a phenomenal release for the ridiculously patient metal fan. For a good example, we're about to play a song for you. This is The Chalice. Mm -hmm. Boy, we ripped through this one, didn't we? Woo. Uh, we, even, we we did a morning show parody. We talked about our time at Hell, at Hell in the Harbor. They're going to be back next year. Yep. They're moving the date, though, because uh, Maryland Death Fest already has Memorial Day weekend next year. Can Maryland, can Baltimore handle two, ex, two huge extreme metal festivals in the same summer? We shall see. We'll say I was proud of us as a city. We showed up. Now, I know people, I did hear some people talking. They had traveled to the show, yeah, yeah. but I mean, almost every it was really band we down. saw, it was packed. We were, um, we were kind of, we were in, they closed the street off. So we were basically in a street that was closed off and up above us were high rises that had like Marshall's department store in it and Popeye's chicken. Popeye's chicken. And the people in the, in the stores were like looking down, like, so that's what hell looks like. You know, it's, it's, Slashing the mosh pit with horse head man and what it is. Yeah, Pig Destroyer called them out. He dedicated a song to, to the people at Marshall. Yes, to the people yeah. at Marshall. That were buying doilies or whatever. Yeah. So, this has been the Snaggletooth Decay Extreme Music Podcast. Special thanks to Brian and Pat from Hellwitch for appearing on the show. Snaggletooth theme, courtesy of Gustav Jord of Defleshed. Sounds of Decay theme, courtesy of Steve Rathbone from Lair of the Minotaur. Badass Season 3 artwork by none other than K.C. Angel. Get over to Devathorn's Bandcamp page and find out why Greece is the word, it is the word, it is the word that you heard. Sorry, couldn't help it. Decay Bands, check them out. Immortal, to descend and chain to the bottom of the ocean. 
All Content 2023, the Snaggletooth Decay Extreme Music Podcast. Raise the sword! This is the Snaggletooth Extreme Metal Podcast. (laughs) 